Hello, everybody. Jari Oona, give me a thumb if the sound is fine. Yes. Uh, people are literally moving from the waiting room into this lecture, so it's kind of fun that you actually see. Uh, it looks like we need to admit people, so Ona, Yari, you can probably admit people while they are coming in. Good to have you back. Uh, nice to be here in the bunker. I call it a bunker now because uh, this is like 20 meters underground. Uh, it might be a beautiful day outside. I haven't been outside for five hours. I've been in this bunker before. I did one workshop before this lecture. So if I'm talking a little bit weirdly, that's just because I've been in this bunker for slightly long time. Uh, well, hey, let's get started. Nice to see you. I really appreciate the videos that some of you, there's Francia, my old colleague. Hello there. Uh, let's get moving. Let's see if this works. Here we are. If you just totally forgot why you are here or what is this lecture all about, lecture series. Uh, we had one round that was a week ago with Yari, and that was about paradigms and the landscape of uncertainty. Today, it's just me. Good news, bad news, you can judge later. But we're going to talk about organizational transformation and then going further and further. A couple of things. First of all, I actually going to swap. So uh, what we're going to do, rather than from the original schedule, I'm going to swap those two lectures. So next week, we're going to talk about lean, agile design, lean startup, and all those religions. And uh, how do they fit into the organizational transformation and so forth. And I'm going to move the toolbox and sprints after Yaris lecture about facilitation. Uh, I'm sure you're OK with that. If you're not, there isn't much you can do about it, but that's life. Uh, it was really fun that you did these exercises. Thanks for everybody who did them. Uh, some of you it was compulsory, but thanks anyway. Uh, because thanks for it was really nice looking at what, what did you actually do? What did you answer and what kind of diagrams you did? Because this is a big course. Uh, you are now, for example, over 200 people. So, and as you can see, I'm in the bunker. You are not here in the lecture room. So it's really for us teachers to understand, how, you know, what are you thinking? What are you doing? Is, is any of this that we're talking making any sense to you? So these exercises are super important in that sense. So a few words about them. Uh, then I'm going to dig into the topics of today. And I'm uh, going to do my best to bring today's topic from what Yari talked last week. So kind of tying it together. And then uh, we're going to have a break around five, five minute coffee break or whatever you drink. And then we're going to move into the uh, second part. And during that second part, uh, I'm going to, again, break you into smaller rooms. And you can discuss a little bit together again about the topics of today. And then we wrap up by 6 o'clock Finnish time. Good. Here's a couple of answers um, that I picked up from, from your exercises. So a few words about exercise one, because now I can better see that what actually happened when you start doing it. This was a warm-up exercise, warming up, you know, for this uh, course, but also you warming up the doing online work with people you don't know before. A couple of excellent points, such as this first one, that this audience model doesn't really give a truthful image of the complexities of our multilateral uh, cooperation. Excellent point, excellent learning. And uh, the other comment I picked was that the value of the onion exercise is only to understand the context. Yeah, more valuable would be understanding the details of the project and so forth and so on. Excellent point again. Then the third example over here is a little bit, uh, one of the onions I got. I kind of a little bit changed the, uh, so that you cannot uh, identify who the person is, uh, which is a very simple model. Oh, I almost forgot, uh, pay attention. Sincere apologies for the mistake that we made. We did a mistake and put your email addresses into the CC uh, box when they should have been in the blinded BCC box. So that was just a human mistake. We're really sorry about it. And that caused a little bit of a hassle of with, with some people putting that into their calendars and all of you getting calendar markings and so on. So our apologies. We will definitely be much more careful with, with your emails and um, information.
information further on. So, uh, but if, if you want to comment something, then of course uh, be in touch with us. And, and if you want us to discuss more about it, then we'll do it. But we're sorry about it. That was totally a human mistake. Good. Back to the topic. So here are a couple of the examples that from the exercises that I took. Um, to sum it up, now that I actually saw what you did with these exercises, I think one of the lessons learned from the onion is, first of all, the onion is a simplification. Of course it is a simplification. That's the power of it. And when you're taking a simplification into something complex like the real world, you need to cut corners. And when you're cutting corners, you need to know why. Why are you cutting corners? In other words, you need to have focus. So imagine a sales self as a facilitator. This is what this course is all about. And you take this toolbox, the onion tool, and now you start talking with another person and you're facilitating the discussion to understand what kind of a context they have. Now, if you don't have any focus, if you don't know what you are doing, or why you are doing, why am I facilitating this? Then of course the onion doesn't work. It's like, I'm just cutting corners because I'm cutting corners. And uh, that's why actually now it's really important to understand that if you look back at the tool that you played with a little bit last week, it really, you can use the tool when you know you have an agenda, you know why you are using it. You know what is the impact you're aiming for, why am I, why are we describing this context? Why am I interested in your context? What's my role? What are my reasons? And why are we drawing the onion? And to sum it up, it's really that last sentence of it as, what is actually the change you are facilitating? And sometimes it's obvious, and sometimes it's too obvious. You can't see the forest for the trees. You kind of take these tools and you just do stuff and you never ever discuss, sit down or make it clear, what is actually the change that I'm facilitating? And if you don't have that focus, then of course the onion tool eh, kind of doesn't make sense. Or you don't understand what are you simplifying when you use it. Okay, a few examples. So let's say, for example, uh, you're a student. Uh, most of you are at the moment because you're listening to a lecture. So there's you, and then there's this exercise. This exercise is part of a larger context, which is this course, which is maybe part of a larger context, which is your degree. Now you can do the onion exercise here. Ah, but this is not actually an organization now, is it? So if you don't have an organizational context, you're not sure what the added value of the onion is. Okay, let's give it an organization. The organization is you, you and your pair from last week. The next level is all the course participants uh, and maybe everyone at the course. So that's an organization. But what is missing in this picture? You actually don't have any agenda for change. This organization as such, this course is not, you know, your role is not to drive change in this organization. Which brings me to the lesson learned from last week's exercise is really about this, that you need to start understanding that these tools or facilitation in general starts making sense once you have an organization. And when you're doing these pair exercises, like the one you're getting this week, you need to realize what's my pair? What is their role in this organization? What is the change they want to drive? What is the why? Why am I doing this? I'm trying to help that person to facilitate, or I'm trying to understand how I'm gonna facilitate the change. And only then you can see what is the relevant context. So that's really kind of the point of the onion exercise. And that's the reason kind of describing all this now after you have kind of warmed up and you did all these exercises. I'm not saying they were right or they were wrong, but it was definitely a warm up of understanding the context and really to provoke you to think about, yes, the context, but also now looking at the tool. And we're gonna to return to this when we look at this week's exercise, okay? So that was about the exercise. Then a few reminders from last week, from previous lecture, Actually, I stole a couple of Yari's slides, but I got his permission because they were good slides. Because I'm going to kind of use them for the whole lecture. 
So first of all, Yari, remember, Yari talked about taking a step back, being aware of the lenses we have, the different views, perspective, or lenses we have when we start understanding the organization where we have a role as a change agent, change leader, facilitator, whatever. And we need to be quite conscious and aware of the different lenses we are using. Otherwise, we're kind of just blindly going without understanding anything further. And Yari presented this, uh, kind of the contextuality, which was really kind of the point of the exercise as well. And, and related to that, we have different language meanings, we have relationships, we have processes, or, or the whole thing is a process, not a static thing, and so forth and so forth. Or to put in other words, I'm kind of building a bridge towards my, my point for today, is that there's really no single truth about the organization. There is not a single truth that this is our organization. There's multiple truths because there are different contexts and there are different lenses. So you have a multiple. You cannot just take a single one. So it's a mess, if we can say so. But the point is that you this should not paralyze you. So again, I'm talking when I say you, I'm talking you as the change agent, change leader, uh, facilitator. That okay, this might paralyze you and say, oh man, there's not a, there's no organization that I can figure out. There is no single truth what our organization is. The organizational reality is too complex. But don't worry, you can still be very calm, rational, and analytical about it. But just, this slide is all about, just don't make the mistake that you can fully explain an organization by taking some kind of static parts and putting them together and saying that these static parts interact like this. That is not, that is, yes, that's one way, that's one lens of looking at the organization, but it is not the single truth. So, However, as a facilitator, as a person trying to make change in an organization, you should not be paralyzed, but you should and you can start simplifying and reducing things. So out of those little, all little frames in that picture on the right-hand side, uh, yes, you should choose one. But then you need to understand what is the lens that you chose and why. And what are the, all the other lenses and perspectives that you're leaving out and why? So you're doing simplification, just like with the onion exercise. You're doing a simplification, yes, and that's what you should do because we need to simplify things so we can communicate them and figure out what's going on and, and especially facilitating change. But you need to be very conscious of your selections and choosings of what you are do, leaving in and leaving out. now we get to the kind of the point of today that what does a cultural transformation look like and in all simplicity the question is that okay if i take what you Risto just said that there's not a single truth of what cultural transformation is especially not even a single truth within a one organization then the first thing is that, okay, from whose perspective are you talking about? Because the transformation looks different for different people, obviously. And then again, what is the lens that we choose when we look at the transformation? And here, in all simplicity, we can have, for example, a couple of lenses that we can use. Outside perspective, what does it look? Here's an organization, we're not working in that organization, we're outsiders. What does, look, what does the transformation look like from an outside perspective? That's one lens. What about top management? The people who are at the end of the day char in charge of the whole organization. How do they see it? Then we have something that we might call middle management. How do they see it? What does their world look like? And maybe we can go further down into the business owners or a team leader, some kind of a one level below middle management, if you want. And then the grassroots. 
we can call it a grassroots worker or like I put here, the grassroots change agent. From their perspective, what does it look like? And I'm gonna now look like look at from these different lenses, if you will. So first today, let's have a look what it might look like from an outsider. What does it look like from top management? And then kind of what does it look like really if you are the person doing the change? Good. I'll have a sip of coffee before we start. Also, I guess need to check the uh, chat over there. And of course, we have another chat as well to make sure if there's something wrong with things. Okay, everybody ready? If Franze gives us a thumb up, then we'll continue. Then we'll continue. Thank you very much. <laughs> so let's have maybe an outside perspective. Lens number one. Let's have a look at what it looks like. Hey, remember this? I had this last time. So this was kind of my, if you will, anti-Taylor vision that I'm sure that many companies and organizations, or let's say it is in fashion at the moment out there, this kind of new, lean, new culture that organizations are in. So if you're a designer, change leader, change engineer, whatever, you probably understand that, yes, where I'm working, it's this people are aspiring for this kind of a culture where grassroots take responsibility more. Yeah, not just responsibility, they're given power to make decisions. There's a transparency of information. Anybody can see what's going on. Anybody can check. Because if you're going to make decisions on the grassroots level, you better know, have all the information to make good decisions. Focus more on the end results, not so much that you are doing things, you know, it's not focusing on the process of how you get results, the results matter more. And we need happy, creative, talented people to do this because this is actually mentally quite taxing. It takes a lot of energy to take all that responsibility and so on. So what does it look like? So I got together, this was, uh, you can see the reference there. Two years ago, I worked a little bit at the Bearing Point, which is a European uh, management consultancy. I worked here in Finland in their offices with the digital strategy consultants. And they have done a lot of these transformations, uh, especially from the top management perspective. Uh, so they had been a lot of facilitating change leadership. So we got together with my background and their background and thought about, hmm, we're consultants. What do we need? A maturity model. So uh, this is what we came up with. That it seemed like, so now we're talking more about the Finnish domain, but I'm pretty sure that this is easily transferable to uh, most of, of Western large corporations. So it seems like that things go like this. Transformation from an outside perspective. First, we have this, the company corporation has this group of disconnected pioneers. So enthusiastic people who have read a book or maybe just joined the company and are like, hey, let's do this lean way of doing, or, or maybe they're, you know, freshly hired designers coming in that, hey, why are we doing things like this? Where I came from, we don't did things like this. this. So they, they're really enthusiastic and they believe that there's another way of doing things. Uh, they meet each other, they talk and so forth. And gradually what happens is the next step these people start organizing, and this is definitely a grassroots organization. They decide that, you know, we've been now talking over coffee about this for half a year. Why don't we just organize trainings for other people? Let's start do scrum trainings for anybody of our colleagues who are interested in. So they get organized mostly unofficially. And now what top management sees that, hey, what's happening in our, in our organization? Uh, these people seem to be doing exactly the stuff that this uh, lecturer was talking about. And our board of directors is talking about this lean agile thing and hey, it's happening in our company. So in a good way, they start noticing that there's something good going on. And that's when the next step happens. So this is what I call is a big wheel of change. The, the top management gets together is like, yes, this is exactly what we need. We need a new company culture. We need the new ways of working. We need to start, you know, having people thinking that way in this. 
and they form some kind of a transformation program. This is an official transformation program and we have just hired a transformation program manager to do this. And maybe they even give a budget and they start creating a vision and a strategy that this is how our company is going to change. So it becomes official. And that's of course a good thing. And then somewhere there in the, in the uh, end you can see is the next step. There's a new normal that everybody's looking for. That after this big wheel of changes, our culture is this amazing new normal. And to be a little bit more practical, you know, typical things that happen here that you start activating pioneers, you do a cultural survey to figure out what's really going on in the company. And you start defining a vision at some stage, you start doing pilots, scaling up, you start trying new governance models, and so forth. Okay, any examples? Yes, of course. So uh, I hope Mirette is uh, there listening because I'm going to use Ule, the Finnish broadcasting company, as an example. So I have not been involved in this, but I've definitely been an outsider. I've been looking at what's going on at Ule and uh, talking with a lot of people there and hearing how it's going. And actually, I have a master's thesis working at the moment, looking at really at what has happened at Ule. So definitely at Ule, uh, I would say, uh, Ule people can correct me somewhere if I'm wrong, but at least a decade ago, when they actively started doing their digital offering into the streaming services, of course, what happened was that a lot of people with uh, agile scrum background were hired and maybe some consultancies as well. So definitely there was these enthusiastic pioneers that wanted to do things differently, digital development. We have to remember that a broadcasting company is a media company. It's not an ICT company as such. So these people were bringing new ways of working, new ways of doing group work. So what happened gradually was that they, at ULE, they started doing agile PO trainings, project, uh, product owner trainings, to connect the like-minded people and spread the word a little bit. They had events and get-togethers and, and you know, people talking and taking all of these thinking and aspects and, and kind of localizing it. What does it mean for us here at this company? And what does it mean in this part of the organization? And gradually there start emerging clear leaders and people to contact. Uh, hey, I've heard about that training. Who should I ask? Well, go and ask Mirette about it. And, and you know, she knows about it and so forth. And eventually what happens was that uh, maybe the Finns here in the audience remember that, but this uh, broadcasting company had a company crisis maybe a few years ago. Uh, nothing to do with uh, ways of working and culture as such, but more about politics and uh, ethics of, of uh, journalism. But anyway, crisis is an opportunity, if you will. And so what happened that they hired a new CEO for the whole company. And in part of that process, our company culture became on the board agenda. So the topest of the top management wanted to create a company culture that was really good. So that kind of literally became part of why the, how the new CEO was hired and it literally got on the board agenda. And then things of course started happening. The big wheels started turning and so forth and so forth. And then we get to the fourth part. I hope you can see it, it kind of depends if you have this uh, zoom window blocking the right hand side of the slide. But you can see that there was eventually a new normal. I mean, that things were starting to happen. And I really like the fact that I've been sticking around and, and talking with ULE people was that what they actually realized that uh, the world wasn't ready even after their big wheel of change because what they started then thinking about is that uh, what is actually our vision as a company? Um, what is the objective of all this agile and lean culture? What, you know, maybe before that, if you will, the revolutionaries were like, oh, viva la revolucion. And we just need the revolution. We need everybody to become lean and agile and, and customer centric. And just getting that done, they kind of block the fact that once you once the revolu revolution is done, you are start thinking that why do we actually want to do what is what why do we need what is what are we gonna use this new culture for? And that's again, I think uh, Ule has been a great example of having these discussions and moving forward. 
So now they, their goal is the digital cost of Rexpedia. So that's the goal, that's the beacon. And the way to get there is the company culture. Good. Then we, of course, I have another example, which is that things don't necessarily go like that. So this is anonymous, I'm not gonna tell which is. Again, I was looking from the outside in. Disconnected pioneers, just like that, people, just like the previous example. People really enthusiastic, wanting to do new things, new ways. Uh, new people hired, putting people together, acceleration program created so people can, so actually people in the R&D and innovation part start doing things differently. However, a small wheel of change. Top management did not really buy into this new way of working or saw too many problems with it. So what happens is that the uh, next steps become too small. There's no uh, top executive support. The people, the pioneers get frustrated. They leave the company and then the whole momentum kind of withers away. And, uh, and then it started in this organization again. I'm not saying if this is good or bad, I'm just saying that maybe this is how it was supposed to go. Maybe that organization wasn't ready for the big wheel of change and they had to do this before they were ready for it. Anyway, I think this is another typical way of doing how things might turn out. My main point, company culture changes. And that was Yari, what Yari talked about last week about processuality. Uh, it's not a static thing. It's a living organism, if you will. And in a way it changes and it lives and the top management can react to it, to put it, if I can be a bit provocative. That you cannot kind of sit down and plan that this is our company culture and then you one morning implement it. The company culture happens, it's too complex. So you can actually react to it and start trying to steer it in one way or another. My other point is that the change is not linear. It's not so that the transformation happens gradually every day. But I'm saying that it happens in leaps. It happens jumps. And those jumps are, of course, important in pushing it further. And typically, those might be the jumps that, that we have in our model over there. <clears throat> One more thing. Beware of populism. When you talk about company cultures, especially if you're a grassroots change agent, and I would say especially if your background is that, let's say, you come from uh, agile development and you have done 10 years of agile development and you're really good at it, and then you look at some large corporation and you're like, oh, my God, how are they so slow? And, and you look at their big bosses and top executives. It's so tempting to go, oh, they don't just get it. They don't get this agile, lean, new culture where grassroots and all of this. So word of warning, I'm gonna have a little story now, uh, but the point is that don't fall. It's, it is populism in our little corner of the world, facilitation word, world, that it's so easy to go, oh, the bosses are so stupid, they don't get it. Because I kind of have seen this happen so many times. So here are the little pieces, the red pieces on the left. They are those brilliant, typically a little bit younger than older, designer, developer, business people, agile, lean, whatever people. And uh, they get together and they're like, oh, we don't need any bosses and we're autonomous and, and grassroots, they give more decision power. It's, it's really the revolution going on here. Old men in suits, they are dumb, they don't get it. Everything is so bureaucratic and slow. What we demand is a flat organization. Hey, let's workshop this, the sprint on the Kanban, and everybody goes. And then the boss person is, what? The boss person probably is thinking questions like these. Uh, so when you talk about this, are you actually talking about projects, tools, capabilities, ways of working? What, what's the context? Can you please explain me? What are you talking about? Uh, our corporation does a lot of investments to take our company culture and everything. 
So how does this compare to the other investments we do? Should we invest in this new culture or how can you can you give some context about it? Uh, how about how do you coordinate among yourselves? You are now a group of people. And by the way, last week, a similar group of people came and said all the same revolution slogans. Do you coordinate with each other? Or maybe I like a good question is that I hear you, but what about the 90% of people in our company that you do not represent? Should they change the culture as well? And so forth and so forth. The boss has a good question. And then the revolutionaries are like, what? And unfortunately, sometimes it might go like this. Then all the change agents are like, ah, oh, boss is stupid, bosses don't get it. And then the boss people are like, these people have no clue how to run a large organization. They have never ever seen the executive board of a corporation. And it gives this whole agile lean culture a bad name because you don't simply speak the language. You do not necessarily understand what does it look like to run a, a big company and then we get problems. And again, in this middle of my story of little, maybe the, the change people go, ah, oh, revolution, kick out the old men in suits. And then the old men in suits are like, it just doesn't make sense to put this project manager level person. How enthusiastic she or he is just in charge of a corporation, doesn't make sense. So what brought us here? I don't know. Is this familiar story? Uh, I don't have here you to show your hands if you find anything familiar to any of you. Um, but I've seen this happening many times and, and uh, kind of hearing this at the water cooler, if you will, with a lot of different companies and then a lot of enthusiastic uh, consultants, of course, because that's my background. Well, I think the lesson that the lesson I want to teach here is that when we go into agile, lean startup, design thinking, I think they are partly to blame as philosophies or, or school of thought, if you will. Because if you look at where they come from, from the onion, they all have their origins from the lens of a single product, service, or innovation. That's really their history. They are originally tools to make fantastic products services, campaigns, innovation. And if we look at a corporation like the Onion over there, that's kind of the level where they come from. Which means, and this is kind of my hypothesis, if you will, this often makes a blind spot. When you start designing a whole organization based on those views, you have this blind spot that you don't necessarily understand how an organization works. And it doesn't help that, you know, if we take the maturity model I just talked about a few minutes back and you look at it as a story, story first step, and next in the story, this happens and this happens. And if we put that story into the onion, then the story typically goes from inside the onion into the outside of the onion. And that's how it goes. That's typically what happens in established corporations. You start from individual people who are more inside the onion, and then it starts gradually growing outside, outside, and outside. And all the challenges of a change agent, a change leader, is that how do you actually let this inside change grow so it becomes the prevailing culture? However, I want to make the point here that don't think that this is the way it should happen. If we look at large corporations, this is the way that it goes. But it doesn't mean that this is ideally the way that it should go. And let's put it this way, that if you could design an organization from scratch, if it was not an established large organization, but you were given a blank piece of paper, can you please design an organization as best as you can. Would you start inside out? Would you start from the very inside of the organization and go outside? Of course not. You would start designing an organization outside in. What is the market? What is the domain? 
what are the competitors? And from the outside environment, you would start designing, oh, this kind of an organization would be competitive. This kind of an organization would make sense in the market. And then you would go. And we can see this happening. This is not an exercise that doesn't happen because we can take startups. Startups are designing organizations from scratch, aren't they? And how do smart startups do them? Of course, they do it from outside in. So for example, my example here is uh, Renful, which is a startup uh, uh, established by a few of our students. So how they actually did it was literally like this. They started first thinking that what is their unique advantage in the market? What differentiates them? And then they would go to the onion to the next level. So if this is how it differentiates us, how do we organize ourselves? And once we have thought about that, how do we actually make decisions and lead people? And how do we then split into smaller pieces of organization? And finally, the last step, how do we actually want individual people to behave outside in? Now, if you're some, uh, if you're a user-centric designer, customer-centric person, you understand what it means. You start from the customers and then you do the design from outside in. You don't start inside out. It's exactly the same way of thinking. So to sum it up, large organizations, their transformation happen inside out because they are not the clean slate. They are not. The Finnish broadcasting company is not a clean slate. There's history and there's legacy and there's everything good, bad and neutral, but it is still there. You cannot design it from scratch. And that's why when you go and look at large corporations, and that's probably the way that it goes, is starting from the inside and growing and growing and growing, and eventually you design a competitive organization. However, don't forget in this context that it doesn't mean that that's the optimal way of doing things, that you should always start from inside out. No, you should start outside in. And I think that's an excellent thing to keep in mind when we look at these transitions and transformations that what are happening. So that it looks like this is the way it goes. Doesn't necessarily mean that that's the optimal way, but it's maybe because of the history and the context of it. Good. Two minutes to go. Any questions? I'm gonna put on my headphones because there are no loudspeakers here. We're going to soon have our break. Any brave person want to ask a question? Hey, Risto. Hey, hey Francia. Yeah. How do you then use that knowledge that uh, it's not optimal to go from inside out? Excellent question. I could have been paid for that. Well, <laughs> then where it happens, <laughs> where it happens is kind of what we're going to look at the break is the top executive point of view. So if you think that you're in charge of a large corporation, that you are actually the CEO of a CDO, then you should balance between the two. What is the vision of how you, what is the optimal thing of way of going? And what is the kind of the, how should I say, what is the realism that probably the change happens? Cool, thank you. That's my. Thank you. You're most welcome. But hey, I think that was good. Let's have a break. <laughs>